everyone, welcome back to a new podcast on order, disorder, etc. This is your pastor, Yeti. My podcast is not daily for this time being because I'm still in Belgium and in a couple of weeks I will be flying back to the United States where I probably find more time to do it on a regular basis, so sorry for that. But in the meantime, I'm still doing the podcast, so remember this, I'm still there and always excited to give you some new insights, some new teachings and so much to enjoy or, you know, change, life changes in wisdom and all that. So, today I'm going to talk about limits are good teachers. And I'm going to start with a beautiful poem of a person I don't know herself but you can google her if you want Loretta Rose Gotta so I don't know if she's still around but you can find it out it is Loretta Rose Gotta And let me say, give to you the poem that she was giving to another friend. Glory be to God for bounds and limits. Thanks for, thanks be for fences, for barbed wire, padlocks, bolts, abrupt, unmoving dead ends for stop signs, ramparts, split rails, outlines, outskirts, contours, confines, borders, margins, hedges and rims, shores, banks, and brows. Blessed art thou for shouts and for shalt nots, for odds and shoulds, for prohibition, inhibition, and command. I praise thee for enclosure, circumferences, courtyards, croft, crypt, coral, and coop, pen, balustrade, fold, chamber, hutch, and manger, paddock, coat, stall, palisade, parapets, treeless, and clay, and wall. So blessed by thee for bindings, wrappings, swaddling clothes, for all kilts, covers, comforters, and counterpane, for lids, roofs, tents, holes, shell and pot, and all that partitions holy from profane. Thank you, kind and gentle God, for edges, parameters, and the delicate beauty of borders, time that separates us from that. Yes, from no, the skin from the juice, and thou, sweet Trinity, from me. Praise and love forever, Unto thee, O thou art a most exalted canopy in thy strong shelter sleeps, the virgin safe and free. All creatures great and small be wary Isn't that beautiful? Quite something, right? In the era of supposedly limitless progress, we've expected far too much of one another. Loretta Rose Goddess poem in Lauding Appropriate Limits names that. There must be beginnings and endings to things. It seems 
Only these thing, things can, in fact, make love and create union. Through union. Ironically, differ differentiations things more than melding them into one. That is a major and often confused paradox. We grew up expecting far too much from institutions, from the church, from one another, and finally too much from ourselves. We expected the small self to attain the grandeur of God. Oh, we have a widespread complaint from young people that they hate themselves. If we really believe that the small self can be whole, or if we try to build our self-image on other people's responses, we are set up for disaster. The most we will gain is momentary rushes of significance, episodic self-esteem that will last a couple of days, but it cannot be sustained except by upping the dosage, which finally becomes the addictive and destructive personality. Conversely, we will live beneath everyone else's judgment and critiques. It is no surprise that the word codependent emerges so strongly in recent decades. Secular people have no other place to live except in a revolving half of mirrors, which themselves are being mirrored by other mirrors. That's scary. It has created a very fragile kind of person. Self-esteem comes naturally when I am aligned with who I am in God. It is inherently unstable when I try to create it out of my own psyche behavior or fame. The small self on its own or seeking its significance through the approval of others will never finally ground us because the next day we have to say again, what do I do today to be important, to be significant, to be well regarded? How can I be famous for more than 20 minutes? Maybe my own choice is infamy question. Often when the positive cannot be attained or sustained, people move toward the negative for cosmic significance. At least, as I say, I can get my name in the paper for killing everybody at school or shooting a famous person. The false self the small self, the autonomous I, the branch cut off from the vine is useless. John 15, 4, 5. We have the right idea about being whole, but the trouble is that we thought we could do it independently and within our private personality. And that is the eternal life of the lie of the ego. The ego refuses to admit its own limits and boundaries and thus always self-destructs. It either inflates itself by its self-pride or it deflates under the awareness of its own insufficiency, self-hated. So, entitlement is a poor teacher. A sense of limits offers a much more honest attitude about what we can expect from life. We are set up for anger and judgment 
when we expect too much from one another, from the world and from institutions. This is a sense of entitlement and characterizes most people who are rich from developed countries and most younger people born into the new world of rights. Our parents and grandparents grew up instead in a world of responsibilities. We are still searching for the happy middle between those two. Most people in developing countries learn a sense of limits much earlier. Observing such people is what gives me the courage to speak this way. People in developing countries are usually in need and have a right to more, to justice, but they are they are also have a much more honest expectation of reality. They have a more properly shaped ego. The tragic, the broken and the sinful are already woven into reality. We in the West have gotten away with a false entitlement that did not weigh the tragic into our worldview. We actually suffer more because of it. And anyone who has been there will tell you that the poor in developing countries tend to smile more than the middle class or the wealthy in any country. Remember, the cross tells us that there is a cruciform pattern to all reality. A collision of cross purposes, as discussed in chapter 2, or world, our world, is filled with contradictions needing to be reconciled, inconsistencies within us and between us. Life is neither perfectly consistent and rational, nor it is a chaotic mass. It does contain, however, constant paradoxes, exceptions and flaws. That is the shocking and disappointing revelation of the cross. It is also a great weight of our backs. It leads to patience, humility, non-judgment and suffering love. Now, we have the right sense of proportions, limits and expectations. With no room for utopianism, ideologies, any final solutions, cynicism or needless discouragement. The shape of things is finally honest and humble. Here we can live with faith that God is in the contradictions instead of grandiose explanations. And please think about that at great length. People are talking about this when they talk about simple living. Simplicity of lifestyle might be, after all, the most radical form of social justice possible. It is a non-pretentious way of simply living outside of the whole system of greed, consumption and injustice. Simplicity will clearly have to be part of any kind of reconstruction and rebuilding must move toward a more modest self's sense of self. The grandiose self is like a fragile but giant balloon bouncing around a room and often demanding more inflation to avoid the inevitable. In the postmodern world, people set themselves up to be offended and to be addicted by their false sense of entitlement. And yet, the only real entitlement is from God. When our name is written in heaven, Luke 10 verse 20, then all other titles are superfluous and even burdensome. Ken Kias 
with a K, Ken Kies, 1921-1995, wrote, You end suffering to the world. You add suffering, sorry. You add suffering to the world just as much when you take offense as when you give offenses. Think about it. We've created a highly offendable people who think they deserve an awful lot and even have a right to it. The small self has to puff itself up because underneath it knows it all a scam. Entitlement is a big team in Alcoholics Anonymous. Many would Addictive personalities have lost so much that they feel the world owns them. It is a form of narcissism. But it goes beyond the addictive personality. Such narcissism has led America to become a highly litigious society where we sue other people when they do not give us what we think we have earned or have a right to. I am told that America has seven times as much lawyers as Japan and many more than most other countries. We go to level of court, law and money to achieve what the court, law and money will never be able to give us, self-esteem. Only God can give us our dignity and maybe that is why Paul told the early Christians never to go to court. 1 Corinthians 6, 7 to 8. The true self has never been hurt, nor has it ever been hurt. The only pain it suffers is longing for God and absence from God. It is only the false self that suffers and takes offenses. Hopefully those sufferings lead us to collapse us back into the true self. The false self is necessarily insecure and always hurt. The true self is indestructible and cannot be offended. The true self does not stand around waiting for us to like it before it can like it itself. It doesn't wait for accolades or external successes before it can believe in itself. It quietly knows. J. Key Chesterton spoke of the mystical minimum, which he defined as gratitude. When we stand in the immense abundance of the true self, there is no time or space for being hurt. We are always secure, at rest, and foundationally grateful. The grateful response for what is given, seeing the cup half full, requires seeing what a completely different set of eyes than the eyes that always see the cup as half empty. I don't think it's an oversimplification to say that people basically live either in an overall attitude of gratitude or an overall attitude of resentment. The mystical minimum in gratitude, everything that is given that we are breathing today is a pure gift. None of us have earned it. None of us have a right to it. All we can do is kneel and kiss the ground somewhere, anywhere, and everywhere. I certainly believe in human rights and would not want to make light of them, but the Bible never talks about human rights as such. The only rights the Bible talks about are the rights of widows, orphans, and the poor. The little ones have rights that must be respected. And the Word of God always protects the bottom dwellers and the unprotected. But in a typical 
Western narcissism, we use God to protect the top, the elite, and those who are half too much already. Welfare used to be for the unemployed. Now it is for auto manufacturers and the military. Even the canon law of the church protects the clergy's right much more than those of the laity or of the widows and the orphans. I well remember the excellent poster that stated, I will be a great day, I mean, it will be a great day when our schools get all the money they need and the Air Force has to hold a back sale to buy a bomber. We wait, it seems, for a shift in consciousness from an exclusive sense of rights and entitlement to consciousness, balanced with a sense of responsibilities and social obligations. We seem still to be on one side of the swing of the pendulum, when civilization is growing and empowering it makes use of the language of responsibilities, what we, in fact, owe to our family, or people, or country, the earth and God. The present ungrateful complaining and blaming will get us, will get us nowhere. Now we can play the victim and use justice language, or falsely claim, I am suing only because I don't want this to happen to others. For our own advantage. In fact, this can be the most disguised power trip of all, and just the opposite of how Jesus used his victimhood. He used it to liberate others, and we use it to empower ourselves and to punish others. We do have rights, and most of us thank God for this new insistence on human rights and human dignity. But someone must also protect the rights of the whole, the common good. If people do so today, they are considered moralistic, dogmatic, or cursive. Here the conservatives are far ahead of most progressive thinkers. We have made an idol of individuality and personal freedom or license. Someone does have the right to protect society, institutions and groups. If all we have is individual rights, we will tear one another apart in the fray. I think we have created a mentality that this allows any calling power over us. We want to live as no one is ever going to tell us what we need to do. As if we are the final arbiters of all our decisions, all our choices. We will not allow other persons or institutions, not even our marriage's partner, in some cases, to make demands on us. Free choice itself has become our idol. I choose, and therefore I am has become the new Cartesian formula. I am afraid such freedom will end up destroying all freedom for everybody. The only way to hold such a society together will be more and more laws and enforcement of those laws. Then there are the endless prisons to hold those who do not comply after we idealize free choice for them. Restraint and limits are declared unvirtuous in our society, except that the poor and the criminally inclined are supposed to practice them. I do not think we can have it both ways. Virtue is not one isolated value, but the relationship between several values. When personal freedom is isolated, 
from love, temperance, and the common good, we have a demon instead of a virtue. True virtues is another name for Sophia or holy wisdom. Wisdom is clearly more than more mere intelligence, knowledge of facts or information. Virtuous people recognize its limits, balances, and other people's virtues too. Wisdom is more synthesis than analysis, more paradoxical than linear, more a dance than a march. Wise people avoid the ideological hysteria that claims this is the whole truth, the only truth, the only way to look at it, and too often in the name of some denied but self-serving concern. When we have a new insight or experience, we tend to absolutize that experience and dismiss everything prior to it. I see a lot of that in America, since we are a now a society. We read a new book and temporarily see what we find there is the only way to interpret everything, throwing out the first 30 years of our lives and all other paradigms of explanations. No wonder people are fragmented. So, we can usually mistrust any explanation that says only. At that point, we are dealing with idolized, fabricated realities, false religion, and not incarnate and cruciform reality, true religion. It is precisely in this sense that Christianity is true religion. Christianity teaches us a process of humility, waiting, ego, surrender, patience and trust, and much more than merely giving as prefabricated, to intend to defend or prove. Some Hindus and Buddhists have this true religion much more than many Christians. Many of us prefer only ways of thinking over a process of transformation which always asks us to die. For us as Christians, the highest value should always be love. If we are going to accept the Judeo-Christian heritage as meaningful and authoritative in any way, we have to admit that love comes first and last. That puts us on a different track and forces a different set of questions. The deepest questions are not those of rights and power or whatever or not we're getting everything that society owes us. The deepest questions are those of how love can be expanded and increased. How can we differ to one another out of reference for Christ? Ephesians 5.21 The dualistic and merely political mind will never understand it. It reads everything in terms of win, lose, right, wrong, good, bad, either, or, top, bottom. Only the contemplative mind, the new 
consciousness made possible by God, experience and prayer can read reality in a panoramic and truly wisdom fashion. See 1 Corinthians 2, 12-16 in this regard. The calculating mind, the egocentric vision, is all that the system has. We have a new mind made possible by God. So, this is the end of this chapter. You have a bunch to think about, to look at yourself, because I talk about a lot of ourselves, that ego that I am. So, see this as a process, not as a wrong judgment in what I'm giving into you. All that is given here is in a process to deal with it in your own life and to give others also the opportunity that what is possible for you to change that they can see it. So may God bless you and have a wonderful day. This is your Pastor Yeti. Bye-bye.